Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company with the most adorable machine gun in the world. This is a semi-automatic, actually, Tipman model of 1917A1. Well, model of 1917 is what they call it. And this is a 22 rimfire half-scale copy of the Browning 1917, which is just super cool. So in 1983, a guy by the name of Dennis Tipman, who today is much better known for paintball guns, uh, he gets the idea to make this sort of thing. Like, belt-fed, water-cooled machine guns are cool and all, but they're pretty heavy, they're kind of clumsy to take around to the range, the ammunition's expensive, because, boy, they do go through a lot of it. So what if instead you redesigned the gun, shrunk it down 50%, and fired 22 caliber rimfire out of it? That makes it a lot cheaper, makes it lighter, makes it handier. Be really cool, right? So uh, he forms his company in 1983, and in 1984 ATF approves his semi-auto design for a Browning 1919-1917 style belt-fed gun, because, by the way, the internals for the 1919 and the 1917 are functionally identical. Just one has a water jacket, and one is air-cooled. Uh, he goes ahead and adds another design in 1984, and that is the Browning M2 Heavy Barrel, which in its 50% scale replica fires 22 Magnum, because of course it would. Uh, starts manufacturing the guns, uh, does a total of 123 full auto, um, 1919, 1917 style, 22 rim fires, and 40 in the low 40s uh, for full auto M2s, as well as making some semi autos. The problem is, in 1983, 84-85, you can manufacture and register new machine guns. However, in 1986, Congress closes the registry and prohibits new manufacture of machine guns. And when that happens, Tipman looks at it and goes, well, you know what, that was really kind of the point. Uh, he loses interest, uh, and he ends up selling the company to a guy named F.J. Vollmer, who was in the machine gun trade. Vollmer takes over, and Tipman goes into paintball guns, which is where that company still is today. So, uh, this one is semi-auto only, and it's a really cool scaled-down version of the Browning Mechanism. So let's go ahead and take a look inside. Looking at it up close here, however, we have to start with the actual transit chest, because of course it comes with a transit chest. In fact, one of the fun things is there are a lot of little accessories made for these guns that are miniature scale replicas. There are guys out there making sandbags and little tiny miniature ammo cans, and frankly even belt loaders. Uh, Tipman made a handful of actual scaled down 1918 pattern belt loading machines, so that's really cool. Uh, anyway, the whole thing comes in a case. We've got the tripod, US standard sort of style of tripod, and this is going to open up and work just like a proper US tripod. I've got a box here with two belts of ammo. We'll take a look at those in a moment. And then of course we have the gun. I guess one of the downsides of this really nice blue finish is that you are constantly wiping your fingerprints off of it, but I'll deal with that. All right, so take our tripod. Drop the gun onto it there, tighten it down, get it actually in frame. There we go. So when we consider this a scaled-down replica, there are some things that are accurate and some things that aren't, or kind of can't be. Uh, the outside appearance is really quite good. Um, a few of the things that are different are, for example, the sights are a little bit larger than they would be if they were technically scaled down, and that's because this is a fully functional gun. And if you perfectly scaled the sights down, they would be unusably small, because they're not meant to be that tiny. There have been some changes through the course of Tipman's production. Um, I believe this is a relatively recent model, um, but the sights have varied a little bit, among a few other details. The T&E mechanism works just like it's supposed to, so you can screw this up or down to elevate or depress the gun. You can use the adjustment here to adjust your windage. The t &E mechanism down here has its own little tightening screw, so you can slide the gun back and forth, or lock it in place wherever you like. I can open the top cover just like a regular Browning by pulling back on this, and then the top cover lifts up. And then we can see the insides. We've got the bolt, we've got the extractor, 
We've got a bolt handle over here. Uh, now this doesn't have the same locking system as the proper full-size Browning, and that's because it's a 22. It's just simple blowback. Uh, and for the same reason, it doesn't have a recoiling reciprocating barrel like the originals did. So it's a fixed barrel, and it's a simple blowback bolt. However, the feeding and extraction mechanisms are just the same as on the Browning. You can see that up here in the top cover. There's our feed slide and feed pawl. And of course this peg runs in this track on the bolt. That converts the bolt going forward and backward to the feed slide going side to side. The water jacket is a fully functional water jacket. You can fill this up with water and it will uh, keep the gun cooler while shooting. Uh, not quite so much of an issue on the semi-auto, but for, certainly in the full-auto ones that was legitimate. So these little brass plugs come out. You've got your fill plug there, your drain plug here. One of the nice things, nice side effect of it being a simple blowback gun with a fixed barrel is that you don't have to worry about sealing uh, the, the barrel at both ends of the water jacket, which is kind of an annoying chore on a, a proper uh, full-size belt-fed machine gun. I should actually show you the markings on there. So this is a Model 1917 Tip and Arms uh, when they were located in New Haven, Indiana. And like I said, I'm pr I think that's a relatively recent location of the company, like after 2005. At any rate, it's serial number one of, uh, of the guns that they started building there, which is kind of cool. So the belts that Tipman uses have changed a little bit over time. Uh, this is, I believe, one of the earliest versions, which is uh, basically elastic material with staples in between to create the pockets. And so there's one, one row of cloth at the bottom that is shorter, one row at the top here that is longer, and that gives you pockets into which you can put cartridges. So here's one actually loaded with live ammo. and. This one also has a little brass starter tab on it. Obviously I'm not going to put that in the gun, but I do have a short section of belt here with some snap caps in it, and I can use these to show you feeding. Like all guns, this is a little bit sensitive to exactly how far you feed the cartridges into the belt. But All right, I'm going to start with the top cover up, lift the bolt, drop it onto the first round. Now I can close the top cover. Then, giving this a little bit of assistance on the belt, because it's rather worn, we can run it right through. Because this works like a real Browning, we have a cartridge that actually slides in the breech block. So once it feeds, it's going to come back, drop down in line with the barrel, and then the bolt comes forward where it can pick up the next cartridge off the belt. Now, when we have a second cartridge fed, uh, fed in, this one, when it goes down to feed, is going to kick out the previous one. So there you can see we've got them both in. There we go. And when this pushes down, it pushes the previous cartridge off of the bolt face. There are a couple other legal interesting quirks about this. Uh, for one thing, today it's not that uncommon for people to talk about guns that are firearms, but not handguns, shotguns, or rifles, because they fall outside the existing definitions. Well, this was one of the early guns that very much fell outside of those definitions. Like, it's not a rifle, because you can't fire it from the shoulder. There's no shoulder stock on it, obviously. But you can't really fire it one-handed either. It's not a pistol. So this was classified as simply a Title I firearm. Uh, one of the, the ATF required that the pintle be permanently attached to it to prevent it from being considered concealable. Okay, whatever, I guess. Uh, and then one of the interesting, like, unintended consequences of this was Tipman looked into doing a 1919 A6 version, you know, with the, the bipod and the shoulder stock for his 22 caliber sized gun. And ATF rejected that one because that turns it into a short barreled rifle, because now it has a shoulder stock. Um, whatever, okay. At any rate, uh, 1919s were made, 1917s water-cooled like this were made, and uh, M2 heavy barrels. So uh, Volmer took over the company in 87, and then it was eventually sold to a guy named Eric Graetz in 2001, who continues to manufacture the guns as semi-auto, um, as well as some other stuff. Uh, his company, he bought Tipman, before that he had a company called Lakeside Machine. Uh, and he's done some other interesting things with the internals of these guns, like the BF-1 Vindicator, which I also have a video on. So you can check out that if you're interested. Uh, if you would like to have this one, or a different one, because I actually have serial numbers 1 
and two in this upcoming auction, both semi-auto, uh, both Indiana production guns. Uh, you can check those out in Rock Island's auction catalog. You can also take a look at their Instagram page and their YouTube channels. I have links to those two down in the description text below. Thanks for watching.